you, Mitchell Institute, for organizing on this warm and sunny day. A fantastic opportunity to have a, a dialogue. And I really appreciate the fact that you invited both Ops and Intel for an integrated picture of what we see for the future. So let me just give you a few comments. Um, <laughs> you know, Intel, we don't ever give few comments, but I'll, I'll just start with saying that, uh, about how we see the, how I see the threat picture. Uh, I thought the, the film did a great job of setting the scene, so I'm gonna dig into some of those aspects. Uh, and, and if you didn't conclude, I'm sure you all have concluded, we are really not as far ahead as, of our adversaries as we are used to being. Uh, we cannot afford to look at the threats as we have uh, in previous times, and no longer um, is Russia like its Soviet counterpart where brute force was one of its tactics, and in the older generation of time, Chinese looked at overwhelming capability with numbers, and that really is not how they're going in the future. We're rapidly approaching a world where the United States will no longer be assured of an uncontested air superiority situation. And, and I, I would also submit that developments by our peer adversaries, Russia and China, are closing the advantage to some traditional areas that we've enjoyed. And it only takes a quick review of what's happened, what are some significant things that's happened really in the last, I, I could even say 12 months, but I'll go back about 24. And I'll give you a couple specifics. Uh, in Syria, we've actually seen Russia starting to use uh, a lot more uh, precision guided munitions. We've seen them with their long range aviation have sorties 18 to 24 hours long. From uh, China, we have seen with their bombers going out six to eight plus hours where they used to only fly in their littorals. And, and we've seen both air forces take a look at not just using their fighters or bombers, but integrating in airborne command and control, ISR, and refueling capability. So it really has changed. And it's changed because our adversaries are watching us. They're learning from us. And the, the skies over Iraq and specifically Syria have really just been a treasure trove for them to see how we operate. We also are, are, know we're watched when we conduct operations off various coasts and also today over the uh, Korean Peninsula. Russia has gained invaluable insights uh, and information with operating in a contested airspace alongside of us in Syria. And they're incorporating lessons learned of actually doing a first away fight from homeland. China has established its first foreign base in Djibouti last year in 2017, and it's gonna provide them a unique opportunity to actually be able to monitor our operations in the region. And China and Russia are not just concentrating on defeating our air superiority fighters in individual con uh, combat, they're taking a broader multi-domain approach. Let's take a look at space-based systems that feed our air superior elements are increasingly at risk from Russia and China's ASAT systems, as we saw in the film. But they are looking at air, ground, and space launch systems. They have adversary cyber attack capabilities, and they're advancing those capabilities. And we assess today that they clearly have integrated uh, cyber attack capabilities into their, what I would say, plans for engagements in the future. Our adversaries are much more smarter, they're much more flexible, and they're focused on countering our, our strengths across a broad multi-domain spectrum. So what are the implications, since I am the Director of Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance, I wanna also share with you what are some of the, the uh, challenges we face from an ISR perspective. And, and I would say, really, we look at just an unrelenting operations tempo with our many lines of effort across multiple different areas of responsibility, and we gotta look to new ways to maximize our efficiencies. The days of using single aircraft or single aircraft categories such as CAS, fighters, attack, bombers, are really old think, and we've gotta to transition to new think with multi-role capabilities that we have brought up with fifth gen, but we have to look at that in our current inventory 
and we are moving out with that with our RPA operations. We also in the ISR enterprise have to do and posture ourselves more effectively, and I would offer to you we have to look at data as a weapon. The Air Force ISR enterprise will be data-centric and will allow analysts and warfighters the ability to fuse information from multiple sources. And when I talk about that, I'm not just talking about exquisite DOD capabilities. I'm talking about integrating in publicly available information uh, to our portfolio in support of commander's objectives at speed and scale of current operation and future operations. Data-rich environment comes with challenges, though, including the volume, velocity, and veracity of unstructured data. But our use of an integration of pathways with machine learning and artificial intelligence into current communications, current capabilities is allowing us to develop additional TTPs to fight at the speed of computing. When we look at the ISR enterprise and, and where are we going for a solution, we're going to continue to plan and program based on defense and military priorities to ensure that our ISR enterprise is equipped to support warfighters war across the broad spectrum, specifically to balance our capabilities, space, cyber, and not just simply focus on air. And as we do this, data sharing between our ISR ener enterprise and the intelligence community is paramount to that effort. So I'd like to shift and, and kind of close my opening comments with we've got to manufacture time and space back for our analysts to actually get at identifying and predicting actionable intelligence, affording our decision makers the ability to have decision advantage. You all have heard many Mitchell forums talk about closing down the OODA loop. There's writings, not just from the US, from John Boyd, but we've also seen that from both China and Russia that the decision cycle has got to be sped up, and he who gets there faster is going to dominate in tomorrow's environment. So we are going to learn, and we are going to continue to lean on human-machine teaming, human-machine learning, algorithmic warfare, and pathways to artificial intelligence to allow computers to do what computers do best and human analytic uh, analysts to do what they do best, which is predict trends and actually forecast what the adversary is doing from an intent why standpoint, not just on history, on what they have accomplished. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to my, comp my compadre here to talk a little bit about what is the Air Force from an operational, besides the ISR operations. Oh, no, oh, no it is. Thank you very much. General Deptula, thank you for the Mitchell Institute for the invitation, for the press corps, the staffers, the officers, the attaches, the, the friends, the industry partners, and our LL Bubba standing all there in the back looking on. Thank you for being out here on a great day. It's a great day to talk about the United States Air Force. Um, and, and that video that you just watched was very instructive. Now, if you looked at that video and we think about that video, what you saw is a progression of time. And what you see is that the enemy, not the enemy, our, our part, part enemy, part of them uh, competitors, have been watching us. Dash hit it. They've been watching us. And as you move along, it make, you may question today that video demonstrate we had overmatch in every one of those comp competitions, those wars that we fought. And I'm here to tell you we have overmatched today. The United States Air Force can and will maintain air supremacy today. The question is the future. The question is the rate of change. And what can we do to affect the future? So I was at a uh, seminar. We have Blue Horizons. Blue Horizons is a study group. I loved uh, its captains and majors, its young officers that get together on a year and they study. They pull them out and they put them on a study and they said, hey, what can we do? How do we affect change? And their number one answer was this. We have to quit thinking like the champion and start thinking like the contender. We've become complacent. Imitation is the ultimate form of flattery. 
And our competitors are not only imitating us, they're improving upon what we have done and how we're getting after it. So their comment was, you got to start thinking like a contender. You have to be hungry. You have to do things differently. But we've been here before. This is not new. We have a tendency to forget our heritage. We be it accused of Apollo's chariot. Apollo's chariot was the accusation that the accusation that the Air Force is only concerned about the newest, greatest, fastest, shiniest airplane. It's not true. But we forget our heritage. You know, when we started World War II, we didn't have much of an Air Force. Think of what we did when we B-17s, B-24s, think of the P-51, P-38s. Think of how we gained air supremacy. We fought for that. The video highlighted Korea. There was a fight for air supremacy in Korea that many of our veterans remember. Vietnam. We forget that the Air Force bled in Vietnam. We all bled as a nation, but the Air Force bled in Vietnam which resulted in guys creating things called red flag, creating uh, what we now have as our weapons program where we go out and shoot and drop bombs. <coughs> and think about the ranges that we did and created. But we have developed those, but we've not really kept the momentum going because we were been out fighting America's wars. I just want to remind you that last year, ISIS had territory. ISIS has no territory today. That's the joint fight, but that was also enabled by a lot of airmen. When I say airmen, I'm not talking US Air Force. I'm talking Army airmen, Marine airmen, Air Force airmen, Navy, joint fight that controls the third dimension as we went forward there. So we have to invest, but we can invest in new old. What I mean is we can't just keep doing the same thing and improving it. We have to think new, new. So now for something totally different. There's a book by G.S. Gwynn. It's called Pass the Perfect Pass. He's a writer down in Texas, and there is no, I have no kickbacks coming from this. this uh, but I highly recommend this book if you want to think about change and how you change things. Many of us sat around this weekend on New Year's Day and watched the bowl games, and we watched football. And you compare football in 2018 compared to 1973. 1973 is the team was the Miami Dolphins that had the perfect season, right? Bob Greasy was their quarterback. He's considered one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. How many times did he throw the ball? Maybe, I don't know. maybe 15 a game. <laughs> How many times did they throw the ball this weekend in the, in the game that we just watched in the Rose Bowl? Football has changed in front of our eyes, and we don't even recognize it. How did it change? It didn't change from a big institution top down. It changed from a group, a small group, who had a better idea and then instituted that across high school, college, and then eventually into the pros. So if we think that we're going to change by coming in with a big institutional change that's going to change things, I don't think so. I think the best way we're going to change to get new, new resides in those young officers that I saw at New Horizons or those young weapons officers that are going to be graduated that just graduated last week from a weapons school or those new techs that are just pinning on and thinking about how we do it differently. But the bottom line is, it's just not in the military. I need industry to change, too, because industry's got to be a partner with us, because our strength of our nation is in our industrial military ability to come together and capitalize on our diversity of thought and not stifle the new thought, but do things differently. That's how we are going to ensure that we control the third dimension. I went to a school called the School of Advanced Air Power Studies, and they made me memorize this. They really didn't make me, but I memorized it anyway. The quote is, air superiority is the critical synergistic enabler for all forms of military power. It is absolutely true, but it's not air superiority. It's air and space superiority. It is control of the third dimension. It is not our birthright as Americans. 
We have to fight for it, and we've got to start acting like the contender. Thank you.